All right, so let's get this thing started. So tonight we are going to be going over uh, four, the rest of four. We're going to be talking about the sex inventory tonight, and then we'll be going over step five as well tonight. You know, and so last week, well, two weeks ago, we went over the beginning portions, the first two parts of the four step, right? So it's very important to really understand what the four step is all about. The four step is the causes of our conditions, right? It's the reason why we continue to use. When you first read, there is a solution, and it says, we ask you why you do it. Like in your hearts, you really don't know why. If I asked every single person here why you continue to relapse and don't tell me it's fun, because I don't know if you're like me, but it's not so much fun when I'm living homeless in an abandoned house, stealing power from the neighbor, you know, getting high with a candle, right? That ain't so fun, right? So don't tell me it's fun. You ain't having no fun, right? Don't, right? You can tell me you like the effect. Sure, we use it because we like the effect. That's a decent answer. But you truly won't have the answer until you really look at a four step thoroughly and honestly, right? And so when we look at that, we start to understand that we're completely consumed by resentments. Remember, it tells us it's a fact-finding, fact-facing basis. It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. We searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. So when I get sober and I feel again, whatever that usually it's prison or county jail for me, right? Then I feel again and I feel extremely remorseful and I start analyzing my life and I start looking at all these resentments. I blame everybody else for my problems. I'm completely consumed by fear. I have horrible relationships. There's the fourth step. And then the fifth step what we're gonna talk about tonight is all the horrible things that I do that I don't wanna tell anyone, right? And uh, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I, I'm an old school heroin addict, dude. And when I'm dosing, it's by any means necessary. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> there was some fear behind that fifth step. Do some weird shit. You know what I mean? I mean you know what I mean. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Pat knows what I mean. You were there, brother. Yeah, you were there. <laughs> so the most important part is we bring it from the dark to the light, take the power out of it. We're going to talk about that in the fifth step. So again, when we looked at the resentments, we talked about that, right? We looked at how to actually overcome them, um, to identify the, the why, what's the fear, why is it, or I mean, excuse me, what's the resentment, right? What are we mad about? Who, who is it, what are you mad about? What is it affecting? What characteristics does it affect? And then ultimately the fourth column, which is my part. So typically it's real easy when I look at my resentments and I start to see that my part outweighs anything that I could possibly be mad about. Right? If I can't apply it to that specific resentment, if I look at the sum of my actions with every interaction with anybody I've had in my life, that they have a, a hell of a lot more of a reason to be mad than I do about some little minuscule type of shit, you know? Um, then we looked at the fears and it says it touches every aspect of our lives. And the reason why that is is because when my actions feed right into my, when I, when I run on self-will, self-sufficiency like the book calls it, my actions feed right into every fear. I got a fear of going back to prison, so when I do what I want to do, I commit six felonies a day. And I got a fear of dying from hep C, so I share needles. Right? I got a fear of um, my parents dying not being proud of me, so what do I do? Everything I could possibly do to disappoint them. I got a fear of losing my wife, what do I do? Treat her horribly. So when I look at the fears, it touches every aspect of my life because my actions feed right into my fears. That's why I'm completely consumed by fear. So just like we talked about the last session that we had, we talked about developing, which is the third column, which is called God sufficiency. So what we're starting to do is identify how to overcome our fears using our connection to our higher power. And so the opposite of fear is faith. And over a period of time of living in corrective action and making those changes, our fears fall from us. Today I'm Pepsi free. Today my parents are proud of me. Today I, you know, I, I'm on probation. I haven't violated probation. And my PO calls me and help other people on probation. I have a fingerprint clearance card. I speak to prisons, right? I do all these things, dude. Every fear that I had that I wrote down back in 2018, they're all gone, dude. They fell from me. But the minute I start taking back the wheel and doing what I want to do, then those fears will be, you know, relevant again because my actions will be feeding right into them. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to talk about the sex inventory now. This is the third part of the four step. That's what we're going to start with tonight. Now, when we think about the sex inventory, first off, who can tell me what page it's on? 69, 69. You'll never forget that, right? <laughs> I remember. Uh, I remember when we were uh, when I was at Florence North Union, and uh, I, I taught this drug class for two years. And the substance abuse counselor one day, I, she was in her office. I was teaching a big book study in, in, for a group, 
and I yelled, I said, hey, Miss Franz, what, what page is the sex inventory on? And she's like, 69. I'm like, all right, I'll never forget that again. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it actually starts on the bottom of 68. Now, when we look at the sex inventory, sure, we're going to talk about some sexual things in there. But what we're really looking, looking for and what the sex inventory really is about, it's about how to have a meaningful relationship, right? That's what we're really looking at is relationships. Life is a series of relationships. Right? Friendships, intimate sexual relationships, uh, work relationships, family relationships. Like the steps can be looked at as, as relationships. Steps one, two, and three is designed for you to develop a relationship with a higher power. Four, five, six, and seven is designed for you to develop a relationship with yourself again. Eight, nine is relationships with others. 10 is the main of relationship with self. 11 is the main of relationship with God. And 12 is the main of relationship with others through service. Right? So if if I don't know how to have a meaningful relationship because guess who's involved in it? This guy. And I'm incapable of that because of experience over 20 years and the way I treat women and friends, I've stole from everyone I've ever came in contact with, right? <laughs> so if I'm trying to have a healthy relationship, I don't have anything to go off of. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about that. Now, when we look at the sex inventory, you know, you see guys that come back to prison or they, you know, they come back to Crossroads and, you know, or another treatment center and, and also to, Pat, just, just, just a disclaimer, dude. If you come back to treatment four or five times, that does not make you an old timer. Okay? All right. I just want you to understand that, brother. Um, I'm 23. Right down. Yeah, you're not an old timer, brother. Uh, but uh, so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to look at some relationship type things. You know, every time anyone comes back to treatment or back to prison, you're like, damn, what's up, man? What happened? And, you, and usually they tell you, well, I met this chick. You know, let's see, I met this girl. Right? It always starts off that way. She's gonna ride this prison sentence, she put money on the books, don't even trip, took that case for her, I'm a man, you know what I mean? She said she's gonna ride me, right? Every day when they do a mail call, you're looking sad as hell. Sure. Hey, you know what I'm talking about, huh? Right? You're like, damn, dude, no letter again. All right? So women are our biggest trigger, right? We can have the greatest plan in the world, you throw a chick in the mix, out the window. Gone, hypnotized. Right? And then what ends up happening is I make that girl my higher power, right? <laughs> and then when the relationship fails or something goes wrong, then I'm left on my own devices again, right? You know, so it's extremely critical to really understand, you know, how important it is to have meaningful relationships and what they look like. Now, as we read this and we go through it, everybody's situation is gonna be a little bit different in here. Some of you guys are single, some of you guys are in relationships, some of you are trying to fix relationships, um, some of you have, you know, baby moms you got to try to have relationships with for the next 18 years, right? You got to figure out how to do that, you know, so everybody's situation is different. So we're going to talk about several different things related to the book and a couple outside things that I kind of use when I work with the guys and, and kind of get them to understand what a healthy relationship is. So first let's get into it and we're going to start, it actually starts on the bottom of 68. Now the first like paragraph of the sex inventory is just basically saying, dude, let's not get way off track here. Let's stay on track. So now about sex. Many of us need an overhauling there. Above all, we try to be sensible on this question. It's easy to get way off track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we don't have enough of it or it isn't the right time. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We don't want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We'd all have sex problems. We'd be hardly human if we didn't, but what can we do about it? So that's the first part. First part saying, dude, let's just really, because ultimately it's about having meaningful relationships, right? And if I don't know how to, and so when I think about intimacy, uh, previous to working a program of recovery, I would think intimacy was like a sexual thing. But the definition of intimacy is the genuine sharing of one's true self with another, right? So when I, you guys here are in group, you guys are sharing your true self with each other, you guys are developing intimate relationships. The relationships with sponsees that I have, we're sharing you know, our true self with each other. We develop an intimate, healthy relationship. So that's what intimacy truly is. So the first paragraph right here is gonna be like the homework that they're gonna give you and we're gonna identify how to do that at the end. So here it is. So if you want to bracket this in your book and you want to put a one right there, this is the first part of the homework. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to review our conduct over the years past where we've been selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate. Whom do we hurt? Do we unjustly arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? 
Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? And we got this on paper and we looked at it. So again, at the end, after we read it, it's only two pages, we'll kind of talk about how to actually do that. Um, I was gonna get a whiteboard in here tonight and go over the whole four step on the board and show you how to do it, but I was unable to get one. So next week we'll get one and I'll come and I'll break the whole four step down with you so you can actually see how to work through it, apply the book and find a solution, and then ultimately the action steps to follow from all three parts. So we'll get there, but I'll explain it to you tonight. Okay, so that's the first part. We're gonna analyze some relationships and really see that, you know, first off, when I look at my sex inventory, I start to see, first off, egos deflated. I'm like, damn, I'm not really that cool. Like, yeah. I, I really do some weird shit. I treat women horribly, right? Like, that ain't cool, right? Um, and then I also see that I don't know how to have a meaningful relationship. Um, so this is the second part, right? In this way, we try to shape our sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. If women are our biggest trigger and we all want to have meaningful relationships, we want to repair the ones. Like I said, everybody's in a different position right now with, with what's going to happen from here. Um, so we got to establish how to have a meaningful relationship as we go further. And I know what they say in the program. They say, well, you should wait a year before you get into a relationship, dude. But that shit ain't reality, right? Like, I don't know anyone who's done that. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can pretty much safe to say, I don't like to make assumptions, but about 97% of you guys will be in a relationship within your first 30 days of getting out of here. That's just real life, right? <laughs> so I, I like, I get the idea to wait a year and to be able to have something to offer and be self-sufficient so where it's not immediately a codependent thing, but reality is, is that most of us will be in one right away. So we really have to understand how to have a meaningful one and, and ultimately the awareness of what it talks about through working all the steps. So we subjected each relation to the test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and to help us live up to them. So the second part is, is listing some characteristics. If there was this ideal woman in my life, right? Who would she be? What would she be? Well, she'd be intelligent. She'd be loving. She'd be sober. She would be uh, committed. She'd be financially responsible. She would be, uh, she'd have a vehicle, right? Um, She'd have to have a connection to a higher power. She'd have to be forgiving to be with me. She'd have to be tolerant to be with me. She'd have to be understanding to be with me. So I'm listing, if I had this ideal woman going forward in life, I'm listing all these spiritual characteristics of what I would beautiful, right? Well taken care of, all these things. I'm listing all these things. And what it's telling us is we have to live up to that. In order to attract that, I gotta have that, right? So what I'm really making is a list of assets that I should probably have before I get in a relationship so I could actually attract a meaningful one because I don't know if you guys are anything like me, there's a couple different scenarios that happen in my life, right? Either I get a good girl and, and then she gets with me and I, she fucking sees how crazy I am and she's like, bye, I gotta go, this dude's off the chain. Or I get a good girl and I turn around and completely ruin her life. Or I just date crazy ass strippers and all kinds of extra shit, right? I did that too, you know? Thankfully, I'm able to have a meaningful relationship today, but, you know, so when I look over my history, that's, you know, what I attract. So I have to figure out how to attract a meaningful relationship. In order to do that, I gotta identify what I'm looking for. I have to possess those qualities and characteristics in order to attract it. It's no secret why we attract a bunch of crazy ass psychopath chicks because we're crazy ass psychopath dudes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens, bro, right? And then we're like, oh, we can fix them, they can fix us, we're all fixing each other up, dude, right? <laughs> And then next thing you know, we're living out of the Ford Ranger. You know, <laughs> we got 17 USB cords, right? <laughs> Two backpacks. <laughs> we got 15 phones. None of them work. They're all parts, right? Talking about how we're gonna get an apartment together and life's gonna be good. We're getting married. You know. <laughs> all right. So we remember that our <laughs> we all we remember always that our sex powers were. Hey. Does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> too, close. too close. All right. We remember always that our sex power is Green Ranger or is it a Green Ford Ranger? Silver. Oh, silver. All right, silver. <laughs> we remember there at. We remember always our sex powers were God given, therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it, so it's set it in a second way. Whatever our ideal relationship looks like, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. So always remember when we talk about steps in eight and nine, it's the willingness, I became willing to make amends of them all, but I'm not trying to cause more harm in doing so. In other problems, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. 
God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with other persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. All right, so this next paragraph is the most important paragraph, especially if we could all come to the terms with the facts that we're most likely all gonna be in relationships pretty damn soon, all right? So this is extremely important. It's to suppose we fall short of our chosen ideal and stumble. So if I've established through working a four step and looking at the sex inventory and listing these spiritual characteristics, some morals, some non-negotiables, I've listed all these things. So suppose I get out from treatment or I get out and I get into a relationship and I stumble and I fall short and I compromise my ideal girl, right? Does this mean we're going to get drunk or high? Some people tell us so, but it's only a half truth. So that tells me, because remember, all we gain through working the steps is aware, awareness. When I'm aware and responsible, I can no longer live in this, this fantasy land and victim of my delusions that it's everybody else's fault, right? I understand that I know how to overcome resentments, fears, I know what healthy relationships are, I know what how important it is to be honest and not hold anything and harbor any wreckage and make an amends and watch out for fear, dishonesty, resentment, and selfishness like it talks about in step 10. I know all these things, so when I'm aware, I'm responsible. So we're aware at this point. So when we get into a relationship and we're aware, right, we're responsible, okay? So if just getting in a shitty relationship tells me it's a half truth. So that tells me I got about a 50% chance of making it out that relationship sober. If we're sorry for what we've, it depends upon us and our motives. If we're sorry for what we've done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we'll be forgiven and learned our lesson. But if we're not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. We're not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. So just being aware and knowing better and staying in that relationship, dude, it's over. I'm gonna use it again eventually, right? Because what ends up happening is in a, in a shitty relationship, the character defects start coming out. Remember, we don't have a drug or an alcohol problem. That is not the problem, it's the solution to the problem. What I have is an alcoholic mentality, right? It's this thing, and what it is is character defects. That's my problem. Lying, cheating, manipulating, stealing, resentment, fear, dishonesty, selfishness, ego, depends on the attachment, right? Um, so when I look at those things, that's my problem. And over a period of time of living in character defect, ultimately I want to change the way I feel again. Because I don't want my actions to reflect that. I want my actions to reflect character assets. And when they don't, I feel poorly about myself. And ultimately drugs and alcohol are the solution to the way I feel about myself. Because drugs and alcohol work. Don't think, don't feel, don't care. Okay. So be careful. If we get into a relationship, just getting in a shitty one, we got a 50% chance of staying sober. Being aware and staying in that relationship, it's a fact. We're not theorizing, these are facts out of our experience. And I think that if we went around a room, everybody in this room, and talk about relationships, there's, there's been one, right? That one that took you down through there, right? <laughs> so we really gotta be aware of this. Okay, so when we talk about this, um, I'll read the last paragraph and I'm gonna share a couple things with you guys. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into working others working with others or helping others. We think of their needs and we work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. Okay, so the program teaches us three, like at very, very, very bare minimum, it teaches us three basic things. Talk about the way I feel, share it. Good, bad, all of it, I need to, I need to verbalize it, I need to talk about it. The second thing it teaches us is get connected to God's will no matter what. The easiest way I could explain God's will to you guys is character assets, positivity, gratitude, and selflessness. My will is negativity, character defects, and um, selfishness. So I can, I can know whose will I'm in right away by checking my actions. And then the third thing it teaches us is to go find someone to help, right? So if I'm having a relationship issue with my wife, right, and then I come here, and what hopefully the goal is that I'll center myself long enough of being of service and selfless that when I have to go handle that situation, I'll be responding, not reacting. So by that time, I will center myself so I won't fly off the handle on it, right, when I react. So that's why we go work with others, because it takes us out of ourselves, right? We're able to center ourselves long enough to be able to handle it in a healthy way. And that's what it's saying there. If, you, if when all else fails, go help somebody, right? It'll, tell, it'll knock you back down, dude. So when you have to handle it, you're able to handle it in a healthy way. So when we talk about relationships, there's three different types of relationships, right? So we're, I'm, I'm gonna speak on that for a quick second. So the first type of relationship that I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with is called codependency, right? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, okay. 
Codependency, right? So that's when we're complete, completely intertwined with each other. I'm only good if she's good. If we're bad, we're bad. It's all bad, right? <laughs> it's all bad, right? That's unhealthy relationship. There's a couple levels of codependency. Um, so there's codependency when it comes, like my wife is a normie, and so the codependency that comes from her and, and having to deal with me, a grown-ass child, having to constantly worry about me, fear over me, loss of her own identity, neglect of self-care, same thing with my mom. You know, I'm a full-time job that they don't have time to take care of themselves, and then when we find recovery, you think that everything would be better, but the problem is we start turning into the best versions of ourselves, and they start to question some shit. Like, what the hell have I been doing for the last five years? <laughs> Holy shit, you know? I remember when I found recovery in prison, you know, and I told my girl, right? <laughs> And it, it, the roughest patch that we ever had, and I did an eight year prison sentence, and the roughest patch that we had with her, and the roughest patch we ever had was when I found recovery. Because she was shook. That's what the wives to the wives is all about. Dude. Because of the codependency. We're ever evolving and becoming the best versions of ourselves, and all of a sudden that they realize that all they've done is worry about us for the last five years. They don't even know who they are again. Right? And so, you know, we have to really understand. And then our, also our families and our brothers and our friends and everyone who's had to deal with us, there's a certain level of codependency that comes with that. So codependency is, um, is unhealthy. Then we have another far on the other side, which would be called counter-dependency. And counter-dependency we really don't hear too much about. The easiest way I could describe counter-dependency would be like living in Alaska without a dog off the grid. I only need me, that's it. I don't need anyone or anything in my life. And almost in my addiction, I could become counter-dependent. I just want to get high, close the door, turn my phone off, get a laptop out, do some weird shit. <laughs> get weird, research my cases, and do weird shit. Um, but we almost become counter-dependent, dude. I just want to get high by myself, leave me alone, don't ask me questions, bye, right? So that's counter-dependency, that's unhealthy. But what we're trying to establish, which is a healthy relationship, it's called interdependency. And interdependency is based on five characteristics. Without these five characteristics, there is no relationship. And those five characteristics are joint action, shared decisions, honesty, open communication, and genuine concern for one another. So without those five in a friendship, in a sexual relationship, without those five, and it's gotta go to, I can't expect my wife to be honest, but I lie to her all the time. I tried that with every other relationship I've ever had, and for a period of time with her, and it doesn't work. Right? So I have to adopt those characteristics. So when we look at the second part of the sex inventory and we're listing our ideal characteristics that we want going further in the future in order to keep a relationship or attract a relationship, we gotta have that. So what we're really doing when we're making that ideal woman characteristic list, or, or ideal man, I mean either or. Either or. But what we're really, what we're really establishing though, is we're establishing some characteristics that we need to have before we're capable of having or keeping a relationship in any sort of healthy fashion, right? And so it's important to understand that. So now I understand how to have. Now I'm aware. Now I'm responsible. So I have to introduce these things into every relationship that I have. So when we look at the sex inventory, what we're really looking at, and the way that I would have everybody do it is, I would first, I would, I, would, I really want to analyze the main girlfriends you've had or relationships. Like that's truly what I really want to look at and really diagnose and dissect and really look about the truth about how I operate in those relationships. So I look at the who, who is it? That'd be the first column. The second column would be what happened, right? And if I was to tell you, tell me the top three things of the last relationship, the harms that happened in that relationship, go. And whatever those first three things are, write it down because we're going to talk about the full scope of the relationship. If you want to go full throttle and list it all out and have 27 pages, that's cool too. But we're going to talk about it. So what I'm seeing is the relationship, the harms, and then I'm looking at the third column, which is the characteristics, right? The dishonesty, the selfishness, the manipulation, the ego, the um, jealousy, right? Unjustifiably arousing suspicion, right? I'm looking at all these things and I'm seeing that these are the characteristics that are in my relationships. So now when I analyze the last 15 years of girlfriends in my life, right, I'm starting to see that I operate the same way. I lie, cheat, manipulate, I treat horribly, I harm every girl that I've ever been with, and now here I am trying to have a meaningful relationship and I don't have any experience with it, right? And so I have to really figure out what that looks like. So that's what the first part really is, identifying your relationship, seeing the totality of your actions, a deflation of ego, and understanding that we really need to focus on having interdependency in our relationships. Then we transition into the second part and we list the ideal girl, right? The ideals going forward. 
again, those character assets, right, those are going to be the ones that you probably need to have. It says we ask God to, to help us mold our ideals and help us to live up to them, right? We must be willing to grow toward it. So the goal would be to have those before we get, you know, how we think about this, you know, when we got those tablets in prison, right? And all of a sudden, anyone can get on there, dude. And all of a sudden, all the guys would be coming into my substance abuse class, and there's a counselor in there, Miss Franz, and they come in and be like, yeah, this chick came on the team. Yeah, I got another chick on the team. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Because anyone can get on the tablets, right? And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're doing big things, dude. You know what I mean? And she would look him dead in the eye and be like, what do you have to offer a relationship? Like, you ain't got nothing to offer. It's a two-way street. What are we even talking about? Right? And when we look at relationships, if my favorite thing to ask anyone is, does the best version of yourself see you with that individual? And if you're honest with yourself, then we can really see what we're really moving, moving towards or moving away from, right? And so if you're already in a relationship and you're listing those spiritual characteristics of this ideal girl, it's really extremely difficult to try to put your current relationship out of your mind and list, and list what you're really looking for. It's hard to do. Usually you're going to tailor it to your girl. So, you, you know, so, see, she's my ideal, you know? <laughs> yeah, she's right here. Yeah, yeah. part-time job, right? Lives at home with mom. That's what I want, you know? Love it. Six teeth, you know? It's all good. <laughs> she got them summer teeth, right? Summer here, summer there. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just messing, man. But, but it's true. You know, the big book tells us in step 12, job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop using if we place dependence upon people ahead of dependence upon God. And again, man, if you're anything like me, dude, I start worshiping my girl or my relationship, and when something happens negative in there, dude, it becomes extremely dangerous for me. And the next thing that I would ask you guys to do is to come up with five non-negotiables in a relationship. Because everybody can change, right? We're changing, we're evolving, but I can't constantly pick fixer-upper chicks. Like, get off the pole, girl. You're better than that. <laughs> Let me fix you. I got 30 days. <laughs> yeah, I did the right track program, Claire. You know what I mean? Get off the pole. Get the kids. I got a truck. Get the baggage. We can't do that anymore, dude. We don't have to settle for, for meaningless relationships. Right? We don't have to do that anymore, dude. Oh, God. So... Because it's we're all evolving, we're all changing, right? But we can't have those fixer uppers anymore, man. You know. So uh, what I would ask you, if I was working with you, I'd ask you to come up with five non-negotiables in a relationship. And if those five are not there, then they're just not there, and it's not a thing, right? So five non-negotiables would be, you know, for example, maybe two years of recovery, maybe it's a normie, maybe not in the program, maybe one kid, maybe my sponsor has to co-sign the girl, maybe mom has to like her for once. Right? Um, maybe it's a certain spiritual belief or religious path or a certain interests that have to be there. That's my passion. That if she can't get with that, then you know there's no point in even going further. And the most important part about non-negotiables is actually sticking to them. Right? Like we can do all the work we want to do and write down everything we want to do in the fourth step, but as soon as we get out, we get hypnotized again, dude. We do. We're in trouble. It tells me that it's a fact. I'm going to use again. I'm not theorizing. These are facts out of my experience. So that is the sex inventory. So we're gonna identify, and then also too, I like to I like to call the bullshit on the back end, right? Just throw out the bullshit, right? All the weird shit. Just let's let's really look at the sum of our actions. One night stands, everything that comes with we're running around out there, right? My girl might watch this, so I'm not gonna go full throttle right now. You know what I mean? All right? <laughs> I'm not gonna put all the dirt out there. You know what I mean? <laughs> But let's really look at the full scope of our actions, right? So it's important to analyze our real relationships, see the other just insanity of our relationships, establish how to have a new relationship, identify an ideal going forward in the future so we can have a meaningful relationship, understand the difference between the three different types of relationships. Ultimately, we're looking for interdependency, introduce those five characteristics into all of our relationships, and then going from there, we can have a meaningful relationship in every area of our life. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, let's move along. So if we've been, so it's gonna close up the four step right here. If we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we've written down a lot. We've listed and analyzed our resentments. We've begun to comprehend their futility, their fatality. We've commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We've begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look upon them as sick people. 
We have listed the people who we've hurt by our conduct, and we're willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you'll read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope that we are convinced that, that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from Him. If you've already made a decision, that's step three, and an inventory of your grossy, grosser handicaps, that's step four, you've made a good beginning. But that being so, you've swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. So that truth word, that truth about yourself is the transition into step five. So now we're really gonna get honest about some stuff. Now every sponsor does it the fourth and the fifth step a little bit differently, just the way that I'm explaining it isn't the only way to do it. It's the program from the book and usually anybody's sponsor will do it the way that they were told or taught, you know? So there's no wrong way to do it. I just wanna make sure everybody knows that. Okay, so let's move on to, chat, to step five, chapter six. Okay, so here we are, the fifth step. Usually there's a lot of fear associated with the fifth step, right? It's so important because, you know, when I think about all the horrible things that I've done in my past, right, when I attach to those things, right, I think real poorly about myself. I'm consumed by guilt, shame, embarrassment, remorse, regret. I'm a piece of shit, low self-worth, right? Resentment towards self. And when I'm living in all those things, I want to change the way I feel again. So there's something real powerful that comes from a fifth step. When you write it down, it comes from here and it comes from here. You write it down, you get to see it. Then you sit down with another man, you share it, you verbalize it, you give it to your higher power. That process takes the power over it. You know, we always hear you're only as sick as your secrets, right? Because they're in the dark and they hold power over you. So you got to bring them from the dark to the light. And that's what the fifth step is all about, is to bringing them into the light and removing the power that they have. So let's get into it. Having made a personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We've been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator to discover the obstacles in our path. We admitted certain defects. We've ascertained in a rough, fight, a rough, uh, we've ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We put our fingers on the weak items in stock. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on our part, which when completed will mean that we've admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapters. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. We think we've done well enough in admitting these things to ourselves. There's doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solidary self-appraisal insufficient. So a solidary self-appraisal will be me be sitting down doing a fifth step and be like, eh, hey, I'm over that. Yeah, it doesn't bother me, dude. I'm good. I don't need to say anything about that. I just identified it and it's gone now. That don't work, right? <laughs> because I'll tell you right now, we're going to read the rest of this and what it says, and it's important because I can share every single thing but hold on to one. And usually that one that I hold on is the worst item in stock. It's the worst of the worst. And that one item, when I lay up in my bed at night and I attach to it, and the, the character defects and the negative emotions rain down on me. And I feel real poorly about myself. And if I feel that long enough or continue to attach to it multiple times or even one time, I want to change the way I feel again. So it's so important to get to clean the closet out. All right. We will be more reconciled discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should. Well, here's the best reason first. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome our drinking or using. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experiences, they've turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk or high again. Pay attention. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. They never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory, all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough humility and fearlessness and honesty in the sense we find it until they told someone else all their life story. So anytime I've ever worked with anyone and we get past the fifth step and then they relapse and then they come back, Hopefully they come back sooner than later. They don't always make it back But when they do and they sit down they say Jay what happened dude? I don't understand and I say well Having persevered the rest of the program. They wonder why they fell. They never completed their house cleaning dude What didn't you what what you got in there dude? What are you holding on to? There's got to be something and usually their response is oh, shit. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because that that one thing that we hold on to is the worst of the worst And we always think we're unique Right? And I'll tell you right now, I've had the privilege of doing over a hundred easily uh, fifth steps and four steps. And there's only been a couple times where I've heard some things that's like, whoa, 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 hold up. Most of the times I'm like, that's it, brother? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's it. Right? Like, come on, man. 
You know, usually I'll crack it off real proper. Like once you hear some of my fifth step, you know, you're like, oh shit, I'm good. <laughs> that ain't no thing. <laughs> That's it. I'm, I'm ready to go now. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you start saying some things, man. But it's so important. And ultimately, when we look at this and why it's so important to do to to do sponsorship, right? is because the majority, my just opinion, 80% of the program, if not higher, comes from working with others, right? That that is the program. You guys are not here to be sponsees, you're here to be sponsors. How do you forgive yourself? That's a million dollar question. Because everything in the program requires action, and so does that question. I remember when my wife came to see me at Crossroads Arcadia, I did the it was 16 day right track program. We sat out front in the, in the picnic bench out there, and she sat down she said, what, why do you keep doing this? And I'm like, oh, I hate myself. She's like, well, you need to forgive yourself. I'm like, I just did. It's done, I forgive myself. No action behind it, right? So the way that we're able to truly forgive ourselves is sitting down and doing fourth and fifth steps continuously with our sponsees, because what that allows us to do is create a new attachment to the past. So when I share all the horrible things from my fifth step, and you're going, damn, I go, hey, dude, me too, bro. You're not alone, dude, I've been there. I get it, dude. We don't have to live that way anymore. You can remove the power. God, that's powerful. You're gonna help so many men because of that. I just got the chills, because that's what it's all about, dude. And now what I've done is I've created a new attachment to my past. It doesn't make that shit right or cool or okay or acceptable, but what it just means now is it's not gonna hold power over my life anymore. I don't regret the past and I wish to shut the door on it. My past has now become my greatest asset. It's one of the promises. Right, and that's how we forgive ourselves. But just doing one fifth step, that's just starting the attachment. So if you're anything like me, you gotta do a lot of step work. <laughs> a lot of step work, <laughs> right? And so thank thankfully, God placed me in a position and I was able to have the privilege of working with a ton of men over a period of time. Dude, I share about all this stuff freely all the time and uh, it doesn't hold power over me anymore. I tell my mom, I'm like, yeah, you just thought I was a scumbag, but really I was building a resume all these years. You didn't know that. We had qualifications. <laughs> it's still too soon. She's like, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah. Okay. So remember all your life story. So, you know, this next two paragraphs is extremely important. So remember when we did the doctor's opinion a while back. There's two, for me, there's two major parts of the book that really helps me to identify my addiction, um, my alcoholism, my alcoholic mentality, my disease. The first part comes from the doctor's opinion. It says, men and women use essentially because they like the effect produced by drugs and alcohol. I use because I like it. But the sensation is elusive. The sensation that's elusive for me it was 1997, sophomore year in high school. That elusive sensation, when I controlled it, I enjoyed it and it was fun. I, it's elusive. I'm trying to chase that. I'm trying to get back to that, right? But after time, I can't differentiate the true from the false. I don't know what's right, I don't know what's wrong, I blame everyone else for my problems, I'm a victim of a delusion that it's because of you that I'm homeless and did 10 years, 11 years in prison, see what you made me do, right? Uh, what I think is right is wrong, what's wrong is right, okay? Um, after a time, I can't differentiate the true from the false, my drug addicted alcohol of life seems the only normal one, it begins to be normal the way to live, to wake up and boost and get well and boost and get well and boost and get well, and then fucking get enough for the end of the night and say I'm gonna save some for the morning, wake up at 3 a.m., do it at 3 a.m., wake up with cold sweats, right? Try to beat to Walmart before asset protection shows up at 7.33. You know what I'm talking about, brother? Yeah, right? That begins, that begins to be normal, dude. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, he's sober? You can't fucking trust that dude. The fuck? He doesn't shower at QT in the sink? You don't got them, you don't got them Circle K feet, you can't be trusted. Uh, right? That's what I'm talking about, our normal. That begins to be a normal life. And when I get sober, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent, unless I could again experience a sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by getting high, taking a few drinks or drugs or drinks or drugs that I can see others take with impunity. They don't go to prison, they don't become homeless, they don't show up at crossroads, they don't lose everything, give away all their shit, abandon their family. Right? I see they can do it with impunity. After I've succumbed to the desire again, fuck it, I'm doing it. And so many do, they pass through the well-known stages of the spree, obsession, desire, relapse, remorse, repeat, 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 right? After they've succumbed to the desire, they pass through the well-known stages of the spree, emerge a remorseful with a firm resolution not to do it again, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, but this is repeated over and over and over again, unless a person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope for the recovery. So that's my life, right? So I say that to say this, this next paragraph is also my life. Those are the two major identifiers that just explain me along with the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, 
um, description of the real alcoholic from there is a solution. But this right here is also, dude, I mean, and that's ultimately what we're doing is diagnosing ourselves. But at the fifth step, you should have already diagnosed yourself. But here's another one. More than most people, an alcoholic leads a double life. He's very much the actor to the outer world. He presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. It's exhausting to make sure that I don't get found out. I gotta lie to everyone. Dude, my mom loves me so much, she's a question asker, right? But I tell so many lies, I literally used to have a cheat sheet, like pea knuckle, right? <laughs> I used to have to analyze this shit before I went in for dinner, right? I know she's gonna ask me about that job I don't have, and I got those work boots. <laughs> but what kind did I tell her I was gonna get? Right? Like follow up question type shit, right? It's exhausting, dude. And I, I, my, the, main, the main characteristics of my disease, right, is lie, cheat, manipulate, steal, right? And I don't want you to know that. I want you to think I'm an all star, right? So it's exhausting. I'm leading this double life, and in my heart, I know the truth. It's exhausting, right? Okay. The inconsistencies are made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he's revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes these memories far inside himself. He hopes they never see the light of the day. He's under constant fear and tension. This makes for more drinking or using, because remember, drugs and alcohol are the solution. Don't think, don't feel, don't care. If you've ever woke up in the morning, blacked out, drunk the night before, don't remember anything, and your girl's there, and you're like, good morning. You just want, you just want to see how she's going to respond. <laughs> if she's like, oh, good morning, babe, you're like, whew. Oh, all right, I'm good. Right now, let's see if the car's there. You know? <laughs> Did I hit anything? No, I'm good. Then you do the Macarena phone, wallet, fuck it. <laughs> or if you get a phone call from a loved one, you're a girl, and, and you answer the phone like, hello? You just want to feel them out, right? Do they know? <laughs> hello? <laughs> right? We're under constant fear and tension. And so we use because we don't think about it, we don't care about it, and we don't feel it. And so when I'm under constant fear and tension, it just continues that cycle. And I don't have to lead a double life today. I don't have to lie. I'm okay with being who I am. It turns out honesty is easy because I don't do shit I gotta lie about anymore. Once I clean up the past through a four and five, repair the relationships in eight and nine, and maintain it, dude, I don't have, the whole point, we're human, we do dumb shit. I'll make amends, I still have to make amends consistently, right? But I don't harbor it anymore. Okay, so psychologists are inclined to agree with us. We have spent thousands of dollars of examinations. We know but a few instances where we've given these doctors a fair break. So this next rest of this paragraph, you're gonna see the word honest three times in truth. So to me, the fifth step is just the get honest step. But this, the fifth step principle is integrity. And the reason why it's integrity is because if I sit down with a sponsee to do a fifth step and he tells me everything and I'm like, is that it? You got everything, I'm telling you. Persevere with the rest of the program, I wonder why they fell. We gotta remove everything, all their life story, brother. Right, and you tell me that's it. Integrity's doing the next right thing even if no one would know if you did it, right? I don't know. I mean, I got some telltale signs where I you know some old Jedi moves I like to think I know how to pull on you. You know what I mean? But ultimately, I don't know, right? So you gotta have integrity, you know? You'd be like, what didn't you write down? Let's start there, and you're like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? Or if you're like, that's it, I got it. I'm like, all right, you know, just a couple little things, but other than that, dude, you gotta get it all out there. We've seldom told the whole truth. <laughs> nor, we, nor we followed their advice. Unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we were honest with no one else. Small wonder why many in the medical profession have a low opinion of alcoholics and their chance of recovery. I go to doctors, psychologists, my parents try to get me committed everywhere, dude. If I go there, I see a degree, and I'm like, dude, you've never ate fucking out of a dumpster and fucking shot up heroin with toilet water, dude? Then you don't fucking know. <laughs> and I surely don't want to be honest because I only want to tell them what I need to tell them to get Adderall and Xanax. You know, I gotta come out with that, bare minimum. And then they look at my parents and say, I got a great kid, my dad's, my dad's one of us. He's like, come the fuck here, baby. He's like you, right? You don't know, he's the one you're full of shit. Right, mom loves me, she's like, maybe we're wrong, you know? You know what I mean? And they wake up in the morning, they're missing 50 bucks out of their wall, no, we're right, you know? He's a liar, let's try again, you know? I'm just getting those Xanax scripts, you know? Uh, anyways, all right, we must be entirely honest with someone, we're running out of time, but to expect to live longer happy in this world. So this next part of this paragraph, this page and a half, I'm just gonna read because it's important, obviously, it's in the book, but it's important for everyone to understand. When this book was originally published, it was meant for you to be a do-it-yourself program. You were supposed to go to the bookstore, I got an alcohol problem, here it is, 
start reading it. When you got to certain parts, like the third step and the fifth step, then you will go pick someone to do it with. But because of the rapid growth, they had back to basics, sponsors came into play because they had such an influx of people. That's where sponsorship came in. But the book is largely pretty much untouched from when it was published in the 30s, except for some of the stories in the back of the book and the forwards in the beginning of the book. So that's why this is still here. If I don't tell you that, there's only one thing you hear. You, you hear the word postpone. That's all you hear. So I, <laughs> so I just wanted to say that at first. Okay. <laughs> Rightly and naturally, because I read this, you're like, dude, I already got a sponsor. I thought I'd pick somebody. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. Rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose this person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. Those of us belonging to a religious denomination, which requires confession, must, and of course, will want to go to the properly appointed authorities' duties to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. If we cannot or would rather not do this, we search out an acquaintance for a closed mouth understanding friend. Perhaps our doctor or psychologist will be that person. It may be one of our own family. Do not do a fist step with any family members. But we cannot disclose anything to our wives or parents which would hurt them or make them unhappy. We have no right to save our own skin when another, at another person's expense. Such parts of our story we tell someone who will understand yet be unaffected. The rule is we must be hard on ourselves but always considerate of others. Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one is so situated there's no suitable person available. If that is so, this step may be postponed. Typically they're like, oh shit, I don't have to do it. It's postponed right there. <laughs> all right? That's all you hear. Not true. However, if we hold ourselves in complete readiness to go through it at the first opportunity, we say this because we're very anxious that we talk to the right person. It's important that he be able to keep confidence, that he fully understand and approve what we're driving at, that he will not try to change our plan. But we must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. When we've decided who's to hear our story, we waste no time. We've written an inventory. We're prepared for a long talk. We've explained to our partner what we're about to do and why we have to do it. He should realize that we are engaged on a, upon a life and death errand. This is life or death for us. We're either working on recovery or we're working on a relapse. There is no in between for us anymore. Either we're choosing to live or we're choosing to die. That's it, right? This is life or death. The fourth and the fifth step is the causes of my conditions. What's the continued relapses and the reason why is all right here. And if I don't treat this thing, I don't apply the program, I don't take the power out of it, I will use again and I could die. Right? It's progressive disease, it gets worse, never better, it's terminal, it's chronic, if left untreated, it causes death. So this is a life and death errand. Okay, most people approached this way will be glad to help. They'll be honored by our confidence. So this is important right here. We pocket our pride, we go to it, illuminating every twisted character, every dark cranny of the past, withholding nothing. So if we illuminate every twisted character, every dark cranny of the past withholding nothing, these will be referred to as a fifth step promises. Withholding nothing, we're delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but we now begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink or drug problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. So for me, it was the first time in my life when I did a fist step with my sponsee in prison and I was sitting there at a table with him and I told him everything and he looked at me and he's like, me too, bro. It's gonna be all right. Let me have a hug. I was like, oh shit, he doesn't want to beat me up after I said some crazy ass shit like that, all right? And it's the first time I can go, shit, it's okay being me, man. It's gonna be all right. I can move forward from here. And that's what the sixth step's about. The sixth step is removing the objection of being, being willing to let go of the character defects. Step six, which we'll talk about next time, and seven allows me to create my identity going further and not letting the fourth and the fifth step hold me back anymore, right? Establishing my character defects, establishing my identity, the character assets, appreciating the hell out of the fact that I actually have some again, right? And then turning those defects into assets, right, by action, and when I turn a defect into an asset, that's how I evolve into the better version of myself, right? But in order to do that, I gotta get through the fifth step. So when I do a fifth step with my guys, I do like, I do like the top five, right? Um, top five harms, top five shames, top five embarrassments, and top five lies you tell everybody, right? And so what that does is it creates a platform for me and my sponsees, right, when we do that, you know? Um, and typically I'll break the ice, 
and then they'll break the, and then they'll start sharing, then I'll share, then they'll share, then I'll share, then they'll share, and that top five turns into 40, and we're like one-upping each other on bullshit. Oh yeah, you think that's bad, right? <laughs> oh, you think that? Oh yeah, what about that, and, you know? And so what it's doing is it's creating that momentum just to let it all go. So at the end together, we can hug it out, dude, and just breathe and soak in that moment, dude. It's okay, dude, just being who you are today, right? Um, so after you do a fifth step, we'll close with this. It says, returning home for an hour, we find a, a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we've done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from our shelves, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps, carefully re re reading the first five proposals. So what we're gonna do after we do a fifth step is we're gonna go find a quiet place to look over our first five steps, right, that we've already completed, right, because we got to ask ourselves, if we've omitted anything for rebuilding an arch, which we shall walk a free man, is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped in the cement, put in the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? So we're going to make sure that this foundation is in place. We've created it. We want to make sure that we're not leaving anything out. So I'll go back through my step one homework. Identify the powerless and unmanageability. List some more experiences. See if all my life could ever be in recovery or all my life could ever be an addiction has evolved and I want to add to it. Then I'll jump into step two and I'll look at the spiritual characteristics of my higher power. Do I want to add any morals and values? Can I label my higher power? Has it become spiritually progressive? Have I identified how to experience God? Right? Then I'll go to the third step and I'll find a quiet place and I'll get down on my knees and humble myself and do the third step prayer again. Then I'll jump back into the fourth step and see if there's any resentments because it says nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. How free do I want to be? Right? If I want to be as free as I can possibly be, then I don't want to leave anything out. If I think about it, i got to write it down. So I'll go through the resentments. I'll go through the fears. I'll go through the sex inventory. Then I'll go back to five and I'll see if there's anything I've, hold and I've, I've left out. Right? And if I can answer that to my satisfaction, which is the first line of 76, then we look at step six. So that, my friends, is the rest of four and the fifth step. It's good to see everyone again. I'll see you guys next week. Woo!